you will stand with me, please, from the 12th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 54. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. Father, it's a word of dire warning that you give us this morning. But they come from your lips. We assume that they are extremely important or you would not have given us this word. And so we pray that you will open our hearts to understand. But Lord, most of all, that you will open our, our hearts to receive and to appropriate the possibility of forgiveness and the way to handle the dire situation with which we are confronted. Lord, we do pray as we think about all the activities that are going to be going on in our church and starting next week as we kick off all these fall activities, Bible studies, Lord, be with each one who's preparing, the Sunday school, all of those who will be uh, getting ready and, and uh, for the small groups, the leaders and those who will be participating for the seminar, uh, for the picnic. Lord, all of these activities we pray for, raise them to you. Pray for your name to be glorified in them and for you to grow us, grow us. Lord, help us to get beyond just seeing what's this life. Help us to enjoy every good thing you give us, just as you say is appropriate in First Timothy. But Lord, help us at the same time to be laying up treasure in heaven, to be investing beyond here and now. So when the time comes, as we've seen our brothers and sisters in the last few months going on to that place, that we will be prepared I pray, Father, for the honor flight coming up. I thank you so much for the vision that has created this particular program and for the men that it honors and for the way that it recognizes what has been done to keep our country, the kind of country it is where we can enjoy the freedoms that we have. Lord, in many ways we despair as we see some of those, those freedoms being increasingly threatened by one means or another, but... We still look around, Father, and say there's no place like our country at the moment. And we thank you for what has been done and for the lives that have been given and for the time and the effort and all that has been expended on the part of so many people to make it so. Pray for those who are in the service even now, today, and we pray for their safety, that you will keep them from harm's way and that you will protect them. We, we pray especially, Father, for the trip coming up, that you will bless those who go, that you will make it a very uh, meaningful and profitable time in their life, and that you will keep all safe, bring them back safely. Thank you for all in our congregation who have participated in one time or another as, as guardians, some going with their parents even and with others, and we thank you for that. So bless that effort. Bless us now, Father. Take all the other concerns from our mind for these moments so that we can concentrate on you. An hour and a half a week, Father, how much is that to give to you in the midst of all of our other, all of our other activities? Help us to worship you now by listening and by hearing the word of God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please, uh, please turn with me to, to the 12th chapter of Luke. And uh, we'll also be looking, just so you can... Uh, Prepare ahead of time if you want to. We'll be looking at Matthew 16, Acts 2, and Hebrews 2. Some of you like to look those up ahead of time, so there they are. Luke 12, beginning in verse 49, as we have read this morning. The story is told of a man who went with his son. He was visiting his son who was away at college. And, oh, by the way, before I forget it, we should uh, introduce one new visitor this morning. 
Um, uh, young Killian uh, is here this morning with his uh, proud parents um, at the back, Tim and Nyla. Would you, you want to stand up and just uh, hold him up for a minute? Maybe you can just see the blanket, but at least you know there's, I guess there's a baby in there. I assume it's not a doll. There he is. Um, thank you. Great to have you guys here. So glad when these babies arrive safely and mom and everybody. Are you <laughs> okay? Half the time I forget until the baby's like six months old. So I'm grateful I didn't do that. I think I've done that more than once. The guy went to college anyway to uh, be with his son. And as, as, as they were there, they decided to go out to lunch, uh, go out to dinner in the cafeteria that night. They barely got in the door. And the son said, Dad, the, the food's going to be lousy. Let's go somewhere else. His dad looked at him. He said, what do you mean the food's going to be lousy? He said, you haven't even seen the food yet. The boy said, no, but he said, you can be sure that when there's more than six knives in the peanut butter, the food is really lousy tonight. That's what happens when you can read the signs. Being able to read the signs is a very important thing, right? It can be, in fact, it can be, be the difference between life and death, like the guy who froze to death because he went to the drive-in theater to see a movie called Close for the Winter. You don't want to do that. Misread the signs. I want to be able to get the signs right. Well, in our text, Jesus suggests that his audience are hypocrites, living false lives. Not living in reality, but living somewhere else because of their failure to be able to read the signs of the times. If you haven't picked up on it already, you probably did by the time you, we read through this text. Jesus is not exactly what you would call a seeker-sensitive preacher, is he? Jesus consistently, lovingly, but consistently tells the truth. He tells it straight. He does it because he desperately wants people to come to faith in him and to forgiveness. And he's looking at these people and he's saying, you know, you people, you know how to read the signs of the weather. You know that when rain is, that when there's certain kinds of clouds coming in from the Mediterranean, it's going to rain. They had a saying, when in the west the sun, sky turns gray, one can expect a rainy day. He says, you know when the south winds blow, the Sirocco winds blow from the desert off to the south, that it's going to be hot. They had a saying that said, when blows the south wind, you say, some scorching heat is on the way. They were as good as the weather channel at reading the signs of the weather. They were able to read those signs. But the key to the passage, of course, is in verse 56, where he says, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but you do not know how to interpret the present time. And why do you not judge for yourself what is right. In other words, he's saying, you guys know how to read the weather all right. But when it comes to your claims to know God, your claims are bogus. You are allowing somebody else to tell you. You ignore all the signs that are there in favor of what the God-forsaken scribes and Pharisees are telling you. And you are about to pay a heavy price if you don't listen up. See, in the person of Christ, heaven had moved right into their society. I mean, think about that. Heaven had moved right into their society. They were walking and talking with God himself. His very presence doomed the legalistic, Judaistic system that they lived under that was leading people to hell. And yet they were willfully ignoring the signs that would have saved their eternal existence. That's what Jesus is saying. It's strong language. It's intended to be strong language. But it should cause us to say, well, okay, so what signs were they missing? Because we don't want to be missing the same signs, right? What signs is it that they were missing? Three signs that should have been crystal clear to them. Number one. They missed the sign of the messenger himself. They missed the messenger. 
Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God clothed in a human body. So when people looked at his face, when they shook hands with him or gave the kiss greeting as they did in those days, when they listened to him, they were interacting with no one less than Jehovah. Wow. That's what was going on in their society. Granted, he was veiled by his body, so they didn't get to see the whole glory that attached to him all the time, as was true on the transfiguration, as we saw in Luke 9. But how could you miss, if you were around Jesus any time at all, that here is someone who is like no one else has ever been? Jesus was right to ask, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? No one else in history saw what these people were seeing. No one else had the opportunity that they had, but they were missing it. And he tells why in verse 57. He says, and why do you not judge for yourselves? You might underline those words in that passage. Why do you not judge for yourselves? What's he saying? He's saying you guys are letting somebody else define your reality. And it's not real. You're listening to the scribes and the Pharisees and you're letting them tell you what's right and they are not only hell-bound themselves, they're leading others to hell. Why don't you look for yourselves? Why don't you examine for yourselves? I think it should cause all of us to ask, who is it that's interpreting my reality or reality for me? You know, is it some family member that's convinced you of certain things? Perhaps it's some teacher that you had somewhere along the line. Perhaps it's some church that you've been in. Perhaps it's me. But the question is, why are you not interpreting for yourself? Beloved, I do the best job I know how to give you the Word of God as straight as I can understand it. But I'm as flawed as the next person. I hope I've got the gospel right. I believe I have the gospel right. So many do not. But you will be responsible. And God's not going to say when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to use the excuse, well, my professor for philosophy 101 told me this. Not going to fly. My mom told me this. Not going to fly. My brother told me this. It's not going to fly. Why don't you seek for yourselves what is right? Why are you missing the obvious that's right in front of your face? Had they been investigating at all, had they really been honestly looking, they would have seen two things about Jesus that would have alerted them to who he is. His prophetic pedigree and his perfect person. Let's look at those a little bit. His prophetic pedigree. Remember the day he was resurrected. Jesus met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, as recorded in Luke 24. Remember that? And Jesus rebukes those because they are so down in the mouth. And they had even heard that there had been a resurrection, but they didn't believe it. And so what does Jesus say to them? He says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Instead of jumping out and saying, here I am, guys, how can you miss me? He took them straight to the Bible. And he said, if you had been looking at all, you would recognize who I am. Jesus saw himself all over the Old Testament. And if people had really been investigating, really been thinking about this one, they would have seen it too. They would have seen his kingly lineage. Why does Matthew start his gospel with this great lineage of 42 people that take Jesus Christ all the way back to Abraham, showing that he is the son of David and he's the son of Abraham? His kingly lineage through his mother and through his father. Through his father, his legal father, and through his mother who was his biological mother. He's fit to be the king. He is in the kingly line. Though he lived in in Nazareth, he was born in Bethlehem in direct and clear fulfillment of Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, be born in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by angels. Now, come on. How many people have that going on? When he went to the temple to be presented, Simeon and, and, uh, uh, and Anna both prophesied, this is the Messiah. Prophetic signs. How about Herod's edict? That all the children were to be killed 
fulfilling the prophecy in Jeremiah 31, verse 15? How about his parents taking him to Egypt to escape the clutches of Herod at that point in time, fulfilling Hosea 1.1, which says, and out of Egypt I called my son. How about John the Baptist, the forerunner who was prophesied in Isaiah 40 and in Malachi, 5, uh, Malachi 3? How about the fact that Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum, fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, that said Messiah has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. How about Matthew 13, 33, which says that Jesus' parables fulfilled Psalm 78, 2, which said, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. These people knew he spoke like no one they had ever heard. How about the creme de la creme of prophecies, Daniel 9, 25. Don't turn there, I'm going to read it. And the reason I'm going to read it is because the ESV translation of that verse is not a good one. I don't like to tell you that very often, but that's true. So I'm going to read for the New American Standard Version, or if you have the NIV or the New King James, almost any of them get it right. The ESV has it, in it, has it right, but it, it translates it in a way that misrepresents the Hebrew there. So listen to this carefully. Dan Daniel 9.25. This is a prophecy that God gave to Daniel, and it reads like this. It says, So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel's in Babylon in captivity in the year 5, around 538, 39 B.C. at this point in time. And God is saying to him, there's going to be a decree that's going to allow the people that have been in captivity to go back to Jerusalem. And that decree was actually issued by the Persian king Artaxerxes in 444 B.C., 100, almost 100 years later. It's easy in history to find this decree. He says, until that, from the time that that decree is issued to rebuild Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, Jesus. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now you're saying, well, that's, I'm, I'm mixed up in weeks. This is worse than the Granville Sharp that, that Jesse did last week. No, 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 hang on. Once you understand that the 63, the 62 and the seven weeks represent weeks of years, 69 periods of seven years each, 683 total years. And once you understand that a prophetic year in the Bible is always 360 days, it turns out that Daniel's prophecy that Messiah the Prince will come 483 years after this edict in 444 BC puts you right on top of the time of Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in more detail. In, in more detail a little bit later in the book of Luke. But Daniel's prediction clarifies the time right to the time of Christ. Jesus fulfills prophecy after prophecy after prophecy and beyond those that have already been fulfilled in his life by this time, shortly, there's going to be, we're going to see Jesus riding in Jerusalem on a donkey, presenting himself as Messiah as prophesied in Zechariah 9. We're going to see his death and resurrection prophesied many places, but Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, specifically in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, the, the Old Testament shows itself that this, is, this Jesus is the one. He's the one. He's the one. In Luke 4, Jesus himself, if you'll recall, reads from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 which say that the Messiah will be proclaiming good news to the poor. He'll be proclaiming liberty to the captives. And he will be giving sight to the blind. And then he turns to his audience and he says, today. Today. This prophecy is being fulfilled in your midst. Today. How would you like to have a preacher get up and say, here's the prophecy, and by the way, it's happening right now. Powerful. Of course, they tried to kill him then and there. The signs were generally ignored. But it wasn't for lack of the fact that they were there. His prophetic pedigree was impeccable. And it pointed to him being the promised Messiah. How about the second part of his pedigree, his perfect person? There was never anybody like Jesus, right? Jesus without sin. Hebrews 4.15, 
identifies him as the one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Do you ever think about how irritating it would be to be around somebody that never sins? <laughs> Patty tells me she has that problem. <laughs> I'm kidding. If there's anybody in our house that has that problem, it would, it would be me. But, but it could be intimidating, right? I think you see it in the family of Jesus. His brothers hated him. And you can imagine part of the reason why until they began to realize who he really was. He never did anything wrong, never a wrong thought, never a wrong deed, never a wrong word. He never failed at anything. Sooner or later, wouldn't you be asking, what is with this dude? Wouldn't, I mean, isn't that what you'd be saying? What's going on here? We overlook this, but that perfection of Jesus screams his uniqueness as God. Never a single failure. Sooner or later, you'd have to be asking, who is this guy? Who in the world is this? Y'all remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? You remember the movie? I know the young people don't. I asked him once, and they don't know it. Never saw it. It's a great movie. Um, Paul Newman and uh, what's that other guy that really used to be? Robert Redford. I, Anyway, they were, they were in that movie. And, and they're being chased by a posse, which usually was no problem in their existence. They were these, you know, smart, tough cowboys. But this time, they go for a while, and they stop, and they look over the rocks, thinking they got rid of them. Nope, they're coming. You know, they're a mile back there, but here they come. And so they drive, go on a little further, and they stop, and they look through the rocks, and they're still coming. And about the third time, they look through the rocks, and they're still coming. And Paul Newman says, who are those guys? And then every time he looks over the rocks, he says, who are those guys? And then they finally recognize something, a black hat, I think. And they realize these are the greatest lawmen that money could buy in those days, right? They were right to be asking, who are those guys? But do you see that the perfect person and the prophetic pedigree of Christ prompts the very same question, who is this People that were around Jesus were missing it. Let me, let me ask you, beloved, do you really, do you, is it sunk into your head and then into your heart that this person is God? Yes, he's all man. Sometimes in the 20th century we miss that. But he's God at the same time. He's God in the flesh. Have you, have you come to grips with that? I mean, I urge you, if you if, investigate for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Begin to read the Gospels. Don't take the word of those, well, I'm tempted to use words I shouldn't use, those, the, the, those professors who would say that these, these gospels were written you know, 300 years later. Listen, we have evidence anymore that these gospels were written at the time they purport to be, have been written. We have better historical evidence for the person of Christ than we do for any ancient person, by far. Way more documents, way more credible. Read them. Find the Jesus who is presented there. Jesus isn't lost for lack of evidence. He's lost because people don't want to find him. The very same reason that he was lost to people in his age. Most people in, people in Jesus' generation missed the signs. They were better at the weather than they were at God. They were just taking the word for the religious experts. And they were wrong. They missed the messenger. Secondly, they missed the sign of the miracles. What about the miracles? You had to be trying to miss that one, don't you think? You had to be trying. How could you watch someone day after day cast out demons, heal deaf ears, give sight to blind eyes, sometimes even raise the dead, straighten crippled limbs? How could you see that day after day after day and not at some point begin to ask, what is this all about? How could you just be, begin to accept that all is routine? When I was, first got a color TV set many years ago now, 
I can remember for weeks and probably even months afterwards, I would just sit there and I would look at that TV and just be amazed at the color. You kids, stop laughing. I mean, but it's true. It was such an, uh, such an amazing thing to see color TV. But you know what? If you ask me today, hey, you want a new color TV? What do you mean a new color TV? I want HD and 3D. Come on. <laughs> color became passe long ago, right? Give me the... 3D and HD, that's what I want. And you see, that's how these people in Jesus' time are. T t turn with me to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, just before we get to Matthew 16, Jesus has just fed 4,000 people, 4,000 men, plus whatever women and children are there, with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. Think about that. He's created lunch ex nihilo, out of nothing. Okay, then in Matthew 16, 1, we read this. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. In other words... Color TV? Forget it. We want HD and 3D. We understand you just created lunch out of nothing, but give us a real sign. Show us something, you know, really exotic. No wonder Jesus challenged them in the third verse. Look at that, Matthew 16, 3. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. They couldn't have, they couldn't have understood a sign if it came to them in neon, because in fact it was, because they didn't want to see. They were willfully ignorant. It didn't fit their scheme. It didn't fit the scheme of the people that they were following, and so they rejected what was right in front of their face. The same exact thing happened after he'd fed the 5,000. That's recorded in all three Gospels, but in John's version, in John chapter 6, verse 30, we find that they came to him the next day, and when he told them, listen, this is what you should be doing. You should, I know you're just coming to get more food. I, what you should be doing is, is believing in me. I am the bread of life. And he challenged them to believe in him, and then they said, in John 6, verse 30, then what sign do you show us? <laughs> what sign do you show us? Just fed 5,000 of them. What sign do you show us? Give us another sign. This is not lack of evidence, beloved. This is willful rebellion. The miracles should have blown these people away. That's why they were called signs and wonders and miracles. They were vast in number. John tells us in John 21, verse 25, it's the last verse in his gospel. He says this, now there were also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. It's an exaggerated statement, but it makes the point there were thousands of miracles that we don't know anything about. Let's face it, Jesus sent his own disciples out to do the same kind of miracles, including raising people from the dead. They were everywhere. There's no time in history that's been anything like this. So why the miracles? Turn with me to Acts 2. Why the miracles? Was it because Jesus was really benevolent and he cared about people and he wanted to see them well? Absolutely. Jesus was compassionate to a fault. Was it because he was the king and with the king's presence there, there had to be kingdom conditions? Absolutely. That was part of the deal. But neither of those are the prime reason. Here's the prime reason. Peter gives it to us in his first sermon at Pentecost after Jesus has gone back to be with the Father. He says in Acts 2, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested, by, attested to you by God. How did God the Father attest God the Son? with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. That's the reason for the signs. 
That's the reason for the miracles, to say to the people, this is the Son of God. This man is who he says he is. The things that he tells you, you better be listening to because he is authenticated by God himself. Why the miracles? It was God authenticating his son and they were blowing him off. Jesus performed hundreds of miracles every week for three years. How did you miss that? John tells us that there were a few people that got it. In John 7, 31 a few of the people were asking, well, when the Messiah appears, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The evidence was there, you see, but the hypocrites were in willful denial. Willful denial. Jesus is trying to shake them out of their le lethargy. And listen, beloved, Jesus is trying to shake us out of our lethargy too. Those signs were not just for their time. Those signs were for all time. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible told me so. John 20, verse 21. Here's what John says. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. If you don't believe, you have no life. And the miracles are given to authenticate him. They're given to tell you and to show you. They're written down in Scripture by God to make sure that we in the 21st century have it. He's trying to shake us out of our lethargy. Do, you, do we believe or have we written them off as well? You know, they were great at nature's signs in Jesus' time. So are we. We're more so, right? Hey, listen, we can split the atom. We've put men walking on the moon. We can perform brain surgery. I mean, we can read the signs in a certain sense in a way that no other generation has ever been able to do, but that's not the question. The question is, can you read the signs that occurred when heaven invaded earth? That's what's important. Everything rides on that. Look, Hebrews 2. Are you in Hebrews 2? Hebrews chapter 2. Everything rides on this. Writer of the Hebrews says this, Hebrews 2, verse 2. Listen to this. This is, I mean, it's such a powerful statement. He says, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. That's a reference to Jesus. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us, authenticated validated, given credibility by. It was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness. It wasn't just the people that gave us the eyewitness accounts, but listen, God bore witness. How? By signs and wonders and various miracles. Nobody's ever going to be able to stand before God and say, I, 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 I didn't get it. He's going to say, I wrote it all down for you. I not only did it, I then wrote it down for you. The messages authenticate who Jesus is and the statement of God is going to be, I've done all I can do. No escape if you blow my signs off. Spurgeon used to have a great illustration of this. He said, suppose, you, you, you suppose a guy is out there in the middle of the night and he sees a murderous enemy approaching him by the light of his candle. The guy's sneaking around his house trying to get in. So he puts his candle out and he says, ah, he looks back at the place where the guy was. I said, I don't see anything. Everything's great. I'm at peace now. I turned the light out so I can't see. So now everything's good. That's how we are when we ignore the signs that God gives. We'd say, what a fool about that guy, right? What a fool, beloved, for those who ignore the signs that God has given. Not just in Jesus' time, in our time. The signs are good for all time, and the refusal to see the sign doesn't mean it's not there. How many people have set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ and become believers in the process? Listen, if you haven't investigated, if you have doubts, start to, start to read the Gospels, and if you need more, you come and see me. I'll give you stuff to read. Investigate. Don't let somebody else interpret for you. 
What was the final sign? Well, they missed the sign of the message. They missed the message. They missed the messenger. They missed the miracles. They missed the message. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Think about it. Every word that Jesus spoke was a word of God because he is God, right? Every single word he ever spoke was a word of God. I mean, you talk about a sign. That's why Jesus, by the way, his priority was preaching. That's why Jesus even left healing services opportunities at times like in Mark 1 to go preach in other places because as important as the physical healing was it didn't hold a candle to the far greater spiritual needs that attached to people's lives the needs for forgiveness and for getting rid of the guilt of sin and for getting rid of the penalty and the condemnation that attaches to that guilt of sin they needed to hear what he had to say and what was the message well the message was we you know what the message was right repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was basically just saying the same message in different ways over and over and over in the Gospels. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here in our passage if you go back to Luke 12. Look at verse 57, and let's kind of go down through this. We'll see it. He says, why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? In other words, in other words, don't let the Pharisees take you to hell along with them. Judge for yourselves. You need to be the one. You're the one that's going to answer. So you need to be the one making this assessment. Judge for yourselves. And then he says in verse 58, and you, and the, and the you there is singular. He's looking them in the face. And now he's saying not you as a group. He's saying you and you and you and you. You personally. You. You personally. Go with your accuser before the magistrate. Make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. You need to settle. It's a simple parable, isn't it? You could kind of propose any scenario here. Suppose your neighbor sues you for, you know, I don't know what, killing his dog when you're in a rage one day. You say it's an accident. He says it's in, on purpose, and so he's taking you to court. Jesus is saying you'd be well advised to settle with him before you get to court, and the judge locks you away. Settle out of court. Easy illustration, right? So now we have to ask ourselves, okay, what are the key things in this parable? What does the word settle mean? That's going to be a key one. We'll get to it in a moment. But the first thing is who... You always have to ask the characters, right? Who is the accuser? Who's the judge, the magistrate? And who is the officer that's going to throw you in prison? Who are those three people? And the answer is simple. All of them are God. This is a parable about God. All of them are God. And the you is you. You have to get this, beloved. You'll never understand the gospel if you don't get this. Listen, the greatest enemy of the unbeliever or the undecided is not Satan. The greatest enemy of the unbeliever or the undecided or the apathetic is God. Because God is the ultimate accuser. God is the ultimate judge. God is the ultimate officer who will throw people out of his presence forever. What does the gospel say? What does Jesus say in Matthew 10, 28? He says, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It is not Satan who is your worst nightmare if you are here without Christ today. It is God. He's the judge, jury, and executioner. Because every sin denies him. Every sin exalts self and denies God. Every single one, every sin, whether it's thought, deed, or word, whatever the sin is, every sin denies God, exalts self, and violates the character of God. And he cannot let it go undone without stopping being God. 
Listen, Satan is out of the picture at the last judgment. Let me just read it for you, but if you want to look it up sometime in Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12, let me read for you. John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Who's the judge? God. Where is Satan? Nowhere. Well, he's somewhere, but he's not at the judgment. He's in hell by this time. What are the books? The books are the books of every thought, word, and deed of those who are not covered by the righteousness of Christ so that they can give answer and it will be demonstrated beyond all dispute that God is just and they have violated his character. They will be judged. They will be found guilty. They will be condemned. And listen, the penalty is permanent. Penalty is permanent. Look at verse 59. This is a verse that's been misunderstood and misinterpreted. I tell you, you will never get out of prison, the prison he was talking about in the previous verse. You will never get out until you have paid every last penny. Some people misunderstood the stand and they say, okay, see that word until? That means that, that you can, somehow you're going to be able to pay it off. You're going to be able to go through, you're going to be able to go through some kind of penance or, you, or there's some kind of purgatory you can go through. Let me just disillusion you on that. There is no purgatory. There's no purgatory ever mentioned anywhere in the Bible. It's made up by the Roman Catholic Church with all due respect. There is no purgatory. There is no second chance. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Every sin will be paid for. That's true. Every penny will be paid, but the only way, now listen to this, listen to this carefully if you don't get anything else in the sermon. The only way a finite person can pay the debt he owes to an infinite God is by being separated from him forever. That's the only way. So every sin will be paid for, either by the person who did it or by the blood of Jesus Christ, one or the other. There are no third alternatives. The only way a finite person can pay the debt that he owes an infinite God is be being separated from him forever. And we're going to come to some passages soon in the book of Luke which will tell us more reasons why that's going to be true. But it's a true statement. Jesus draws here an awesome and a sobering picture. He shoots straight, beloved. He doesn't sugarcoat the truth because he wants people to know. If you're going to make a decision against him, make it with all the knowledge you can. Thankfully, he also holds out hope. Hope. Don't want to miss that. He suggests you can make an effort to settle with him on the way. Don't wait till the end. Settle on the way. Hebrews 11 10, 10, 27 again, 9, 27 again, it is appointed to man once to die, and after that comes judgment. Then it's too late, but until then, on the way, now, in this life, before you die, now, on the way, before you get to the judgment, now you can settle. You can settle out of court. How do you settle? Repentance. You settle by Repenting. You settle by acknowledging your sins and your inability to do away with them and your inability to stop sinning and your inability to pay for the ones you've already committed. You repent. You're like the thief on the cross who repented his sins and was saved that day. You, you're, like the, you're like the tax collector in Luke, 16 who said, Luke 18 who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God's, Jesus said he's the one who went away justified instead of the guy who was, was naming all of his good works in his prayer didn't go away justified. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and mean it. That's how you settle out of court. It's not a negotiation, <laughs> beloved. It's repentance. It's not trading up. It's not saying, well, I'm, I, I know I got a lot of bad over here, but I got, hey, I got more good over here. Good luck. Number one, you don't have more good over here. You just think you do. None of us do. Number two, it wouldn't matter even if you did. 
One sin is enough. So what does Jesus say? Settle out of court. How do you settle? By repenting. What did David say in Psalm 51, verse 17? The sacrifices of God are doing a lot of good works. Is that what he says? He says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Come to him, beloved with a broken heart because of the sin that is in you that has rebelled against him. Come looking for his forgiveness. Come knowing this will not make you perfect, but it will make you perfectly forgiven. What does God do when we come that way? He forgives. Why? Only one reason. One reason. Because not only is God the unbeliever or the undecided's worst enemy, he is also by far and away their best friend friend. And he's their best friend because the sin that has to be paid for, the thing that every penny is going to be extracted from, that which we cannot pay for ourselves, he paid for himself in the sacrificial death of his son on the cross to take our sin in his place so that we could have his righteousness in our place. Wow, that's the kind of God who is making this offer. Every last penny is paid already if you will just believe, if you will accept him. That's Jesus' message. That's the greatest sign of all. You can settle out of court. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now, now, no condemnation, no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. They've settled out of court. With the result of Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we treat those little things as throw-ins. Those are the main clause. Don't miss the signs, beloved. The messenger, the miracles, the message. Don't join those who are missing the signs. Settle out of court. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote this uh, poem. It's a wonderful poem emphasizing what God has done. She said, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck back blackberries. Have you seen the signs? Or are you plucking blackberries? You taking off your shoes in the presence of the holiness of the messenger who gave the miracles, who brought the message? John Krakauer in his book a few years ago called Into Thin Air, some of you probably read it on the bestseller list for weeks, told about the 1996 expedition of a group to climb Mount Everest, right, that resulted in eight people dying. Some of them died from exposure to the cold, the blizzards, and so on. Some of them died because of fundamental mistakes. One of the people identified in that book was a a man named Andy Harris. Andy was one of the leaders of the exped expedition. And the expedition got to the top, and then they sent some of the people back down, but he stayed up there for a while because he wanted to look around. He wanted to enjoy the triumph of the moment. And he sent others on ahead, and then he started down past the deadline that he had already helped set. Well, it wasn't long before those in the base camp who had gotten back to the base camp heard the radio crackle and they got on and it was Andy Harris. And he was on his way down, but he had run out of oxygen and he was in dire need of help. And those who were at the bottom at the base camp told him, they said, listen, there's a, there's a cache of, there's a cache of uh, canisters, oxygen canisters, and you gotta be close to them. He said, oh, I am. He said, I've got them. I've got them right in my hand. He said, but there's no oxygen in them. Well, they'd just been there. 
just a few hours before, and they knew they were filled with oxygen, and they tried to talk him into it. They said, Andy, there's oxygen in those canisters. Just plug it in, and you're going to be good to go. Get your mind right, and then you can come on down. The canisters are filled with oxygen. He said, no, no, the canisters are empty. You got to come and help me. And the radio went off, and that was the end. That was the last they ever heard of him. That was the last they ever seen of him. They never saw him again. But when they checked, the canisters were filled with oxygen. Andy Harris was holding in his hands, beloved, the thing that would have saved him. But he didn't believe the signs, and he didn't believe the information that was given to him. And so he perished. And so will all of those who miss the signs that God has graciously given, not to just his generation, but to our generation as well. Don't miss the signs. Settle out of court. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Settle out of court. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the clarity of it, the clarity of it alone, Father, um, convinces us of the truth. It's not hard to read other ancient documents, ancient stories like the Gospels and to see how convoluted they get, to see how strange they become. And yet we read the Word of God and it's so clear and straightforward. And, and Lord, it's also clear. It's, it's either accepted or rejected, but there are consequences. I pray for those here this morning, Father, who have specifically have not ever come to you in faith. Maybe they're not out and out unbelievers, but they're not believers either. They're undecided. They're sitting on the fence. They've never really made a commitment. Maybe some have even fooled themselves and think they've made a commitment, but the fact is it was a one-time, this is my prayer deal, and they've never really had a serious thought about you since. They weren't saved. They just were fooled. God, I pray, reach those hearts. Lord, for those of us who are believers today, this has been really a sermon for those who are not, but for those of us who are, help us to have the crying compassion that you had for our friends and neighbors and family members who don't know you, and help us to try and help them settle out of court while there's still time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.